Welcome. I am Dr. Anna Smith, and I would like to welcome you to the Creatively Critical Research Design Practice Speaker Series. I have some re uh, introductory remarks, and while I make them, I welcome you, um, those of you from our panel and in our audience, to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, we're going to be keeping the chat open as um, as long as possible to make this as most dialogic po experiences possible. Um, where are you joining from? Who are you representing? Um, go ahead and do that in the chat. So the Creatively Critical Tech Series comes to us from, um, from the Education Now Lab at Illinois State University in the School of Teaching and Learning. The Education Now Lab is a community-engaged research practice lab that engages in and produces a range of critical interdisciplinary public, academic, and new media scholarship with and alongside community members as we work toward more just educational futures. We're hosting this series as part of a course called Critical Perspectives in Technology and Education, and we are sharing our takeaways through social media throughout the semester at Education Now Lab, um, at, on both Twitter and Instagram. And I will share that in the chat myself. I gave you a whole bunch of links there. <laughs> Let's see. Um, uh, we are also recording and sharing resources from each of the talks online at um, the last URL I added there, tinyurl.com slash edu now lab. And you can currently go and see our conversation with the creators of the screening surveillance short video film series um, there now. And then tonight's will be there uh, by next week. Uh, we've been joined by Fikayo Olutomiwa, um, who is a graduate student in the Creative Technologies um, Department here at Illinois State University. And she is overseeing our web design, accessibility, and presence. So thank you, Fikayo. Uh, this series is co-sponsored by the Illinois State University Research and Graduate Studies and the College of Education, and we thank them for their generous support. And in that, we recognize and are working to make meaningful that Illinois State University is built on the land and waters of multiple indigenous nations who were forcibly removed, um, including the Illini, Peoria, and the Miami, and later due to colonial encroachment and displacement to the Fox, Potawatomi, uh, Sauk, Shawnee, Winnebago, Iowa, Mascoten, Piamkasha, We, and Kickapoo nations. We also honor the indigenous people who we have excluded due to historical erasure and inaccuracy. Uh, today we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Arturo Cortez and Dr. Jose Lizarraga. Um, Dr. Cortez is an assistant professor of learning sciences and human development at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he is also a fellow of the Institute of Cognitive Science. As a design-based learning scientist, Dr. Cortez draws on speculative approaches in order to bring social analysis to everyday practices, to reimagine possibilities for how intergenerational communities learn, and to design for more expansive, just, and creative learning ecologies. Dr. Cortez founded the, the Learning to Transform, or LIT, video gaming lab, and the LIT Lab collectively builds virtual landscapes and role play scenarios, simultaneously leveraging young people's everyday cultural practices, educators' pedagogical expertise, video game designers' insights, and streamers' professional knowledge to amplify narratives that involve transforming oppressive practices indexed in video games. And I think we'll be hearing more about that tonight. <laughs> Uh, great. Uh, and Dr. Jose Ramon Lizarraga is currently a visiting re researcher at UC Berkeley and an assistant professor of learning sciences and human development, an affiliated faculty in LGBT um, studies and the Department of Information Science at UC Boulder. Um, as a learning scientist, Dr. Lizarraga um, uh, uses data analytics, ethnographic video, and multimodal research methods to investigate the role of emerging technologies, social networks, artificial intelligence, and television, other digital media um, in the learning of teachers and youth. Currently, their work examines the cyborgic collective practices of teachers and adolescents at the intersection of virtual and in-person trains of practice. And part of that is that they are the, the faculty director of the Speculative Fabulation Lab. Um, they're also an ex experienced award-winning designer and instructor of hybrid and online courses and a senior advisor for the Algorithmic Justice League and currently uh, serves as a co-principal co investigator on a National Science Foundation-funded 
project examining how to support black and brown girls in computer science disciplines. And I cannot leave off also <laughs> that they are practicing visual and digital artist and musician and parent and creator of the celebrity multiple Webby Award winning Chihuahua RuPaul, the first world's first doggy drag queen. We also, <laughs> so to conclude my introductory remarks, we also want to welcome and thank our ASL interpreter tonight, Shelley Zimmerman. So thank you. All right, so I'm going to turn the time over, stop my share, <laughs> and turn the time over to you, Dr. Corsez. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for, one, the invitation. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm calling in from, from Cambridge, and I am really, really excited to share um, some some ideas with you. They're ideas, um, and that means that I'm I'm ex I'm hopeful that we can um, spark some dialogue um, in our in our small group here. And so I've been instructed to speak for about uh, twelve to fifteen minutes, and uh, I'm going to use the remaining time to hopefully build some questions or even um, engage in some inquiry together. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Lizarraga, um, my 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 uh, uh, media naranja. Um, other half. So I'm going to grab <laughs> your screens, friends, if that's okay. And I love that I'm getting a chance to see your introductions in the chat. If you haven't yet done that, please do that. Um, it makes me feel some kind of connection with you all. All right. So I'm going to grab your screens. Okay. Here we go. Oh my God. This computer is so small. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Um, slideshow. Oh, let me get rid of you all get rid of these folks okay all right so let me back this up Oop. here we go okay <clears throat> so i'm going to give uh, uh just some where where my current thinking is at at this moment um so i gave a similar talk today at the uh, uh mit media lab um, we're really interested in thinking of, in, in this space i was invited to talk about the role of ai in uh, kids' lives today. Um, and so that is the, really going to be the focus of my talk. Uh, and uh, really, the, it's, I, I would, I'm, I'm not going to argue it's a talk. It's more of the, uh, and then hopefully it's an inception of some, some ideas. But just to give you some, uh, just to give you some background, um, I run the Lit Lab, which is the Learning to Transform Video Gaming Lab here at C Boulder. Um, pardon me. And I'm really interested in the notion of futurity, um, how we, dream together? What does it look like for people to dream together? How do you create conditions that do that? And, and uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm really interested in intergenerational dreaming, um, dreaming that occurs across disciplines. And so in that respect, in the Lit Lab, you will find that uh, you'll see high school students, educators, undergraduates, programmers, streamers, um, people who hack uh, uh, um, gaming systems, as well as researchers building and playing together in video gaming spaces. So what that means is that um, uh, we, we spend a lot of time playing uh, video games, but we also spend a lot of time reflecting on our video game play. Now, before I begin and talk a little bit further about the Lit Lab, I'd just like to tell you that I love the pandemic. Um, I had such a wonderful time uh, learning in this space, but I also recognized that there was a lot of lives lost and that it was a lot of, uh, there was a time of a lot of heartache, but I also think it was a, a time where um, things opened up, things allowed for us to see the world in new ways. And in particular, um, I learned about the work of OTR Gamer TV during the pandemic and OTR stands for On The Real. This is a group of black and brown young men who regularly, at least three times a week, um, log into GTA Online and uh, engage in some, uh, uh, you know, gameplay. Um, but the time that I, I, I recognized their work was on June 7th, 2020. And this was at the height of the um, social rebellion, um, right after George Floyd was murdered. Um, and at this, on this particular day, um, this group of young black and brown men who Rep uh, hell from countries like the UK, USA, Jamaica, Kenya, decided to suspend their typical gameplay and uh, be in solidarity 
with the movements around the world to honor and memorialize George Floyd's murder. Um, and in the top left, we actually see that in GTA, they dressed all in black um, and uh, went to uh, the, the, the virtual cemetery in the city and staged a burial for him. They also marched to the streets. They held a protest at the, the police station uh, in this space. In fact, the, 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 the NPCs, the cops that were in the city, um, tried to disperse them uh, during their gameplay, but they resisted. Now, what I think is really powerful is that these young black and brown men are showing us what it means to engage in new forms of activism, new forms of solidarity, new forms of, of grieving um, at a time of deep sorrow. And they're doing it through the context of an everyday technology like video gaming, uh, like a video gaming platform. And this inspired me to think about how can we push on the designer's intentions to imagine something anew? Um, so I also like to think about this within the context of uh, our larger conversations about AI. Um, now, I am really interested in how young people learn uh, in the learn how to repurpose everyday technologies. Um, and I know that AI is like a hot topic right now. And uh, one of the things that we're really interested in is making sure that kids aren't using it to cheat. Um, but I actually think that it's really powerful when kids learn how to cheat systems, when they learn how to subvert them. In fact, I don't use the word cheating, I say subversion. How, and, and I think that's a form of critical thinking. Um, and I'll explain a little bit further what I mean by that. Now, in the context of, of video gaming platforms, um, I'm really interested in, in making sure that we make a distinction between where we currently are when it comes to AI and artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, the, the first, and this is from Searle, nar there's narrow forms of AI. And those are the, that's the AI that currently exists. It's the AI that can perform very specific tasks or functions based on a given data set. And then there's strong AI. This is the scary AI that we're really concerned about that many of us are really fearing, which is that this is the AI that has human level intelligence, is capable of reasoning and understanding and performing most, if not all, intellectual tasks that a human can do. Now, I say this within the context of a, of a video gaming lab because we learn about AI in, in our space. We learn about NPCs, non-playable characters. They are a version of weak AI. This is, uh, you can walk up to uh, uh, NPCs in the context of Grand Theft Auto and they will say something to you or they will they will react to you based on who you are, based on a given set of data. This is very, very limited type of AI. And I think it's important for us to recognize that kids are already interacting with AI in the context of, of video gaming spaces. So for example, um, a, a question has emerged within the context of our video game play in, the, in, in our lab is whether or not the cops are racist this is, of course, a, a, a controversy that has been part of the lore of GTA since, since its inception, um, because you can play uh, a Black character, you can play a white rich character, you can play a white uh, a low income character as well. And there have been there have been some theories about whether or not the, the, the cops in uh, GTA will react differently to you based on your race or your, your income status. So some, some, we've decided to, to take on this theory as well. And we took it on by, by exploring it within the context of different geographic regions within the context of Grand Theft Auto. And there's some interesting patterns that exist. And um, this has opened up some opportunities for our crew to ask and the young folks to ask, why is the game coded this way? We've even uh, seen that random NPCs say some pretty wild things to us when we walk around the city. Um, and we wonder, where did where did these audio messages come from? And why did they interact regularly with us with, with certain particular groups of, of characters? So this opened up this question, why is GTA built like that? How is it coded like that? What, what data infrastructure is really undergirding the types of practices that we see in GTA? Now, in the context of our lab, 
you know, I, it does say that we're a video gaming lab, but I think it would be more accurate to say that we're a video hacking lab, and I'll, and I'll be more explicit here. Um, so Dr. Ruha Benjamin helps us think about a distinction between gaming and hacking. Um, she says that gaming is typically characterized by recreation, competition, and consumption. Here she's saying that we, we play with technological platforms, but rarely do we have a say in creating them, meaning that we're, we're not really pushing on the intentions of the designers. We're just playing the game as it was intended for us. Hacking, on the other hand, is typically characterized by mastery, collaboration, and creativity. In order to hack, Dr. Ruha Benjamin argues that we need to be able to have an in-depth understanding of how a system works, its strengths and weaknesses, and really a vision for how to make it better. And this gives us an opportunity to rewrite the code rather than simply code switch. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us really to embed new values and new social relations in the world. So we've really taken, we, we were really inspired by some of the, the contradictions that we saw in our gameplay and started to think, can we hack GTA? Is it possible? And uh, before I before I continue, and I, I, you know, obviously I'm going to say yes, we can hack GTA. But this is our crew. Um, our uh, this is the Lit Lab. We are a crew of undergraduates, high school students, graduate students, um, postdoctoral researchers, um, educators, after school educators. We all come together and we play GTA, and uh, we role play in this space. And it'll become more clear as I explore this this story. So oftentimes people say like, what is the Lit Lab? And I tell them, well, if you could take a class in creative computing, ethnic studies and the theater arts, that would be the Lit Lab. We're really interested in troubling disciplinary boundaries. We hate them. We're not interested in maintaining uh, these rigid boundaries between the disciplines. We love the idea of being able to make them more porous and to trouble them in the context of our space. So what that means is that we're really interested in moving beyond the traditional storylines that we see in GTA 5, meaning that we're not all about drugs. We're not all about um, advancing narratives of misogyny, violence, racism, misogyny, or homophobia. We want to see, can we create something new in its wake? We recognize that that history exists, but in, the, our, in our creation of Lit City, we have tried to... Uh, create a system that moves past homophobia, transphobia, um, and all of those other forms of oppression that I mentioned. Um, I want to highlight that we're a group of predominantly black and brown femmes. Um, we also have people who, who play uh, dogs. We've got Dula Peep in this space. I, I think it's really important to see the distinction between this dog here that's angry and violent and Dula Peep submissive, you know, but don't don't believe that face. She's actually pretty mean. Um, but in addition to the, all of that, we code. We actually are really interested in coding and programming with purpose. Um, if I had more time, I would really share with you some of the things that we've, uh, uh, what the code looks like in the city. But here's an example. Um, we've uh, really played with the idea of what might it look like if we were to recode uh, the data that undergirds how cops interact with us in the city. And this has given us an opportunity to understand how the AI works in the city, simultaneously giving us opportunity to reimagine it. Same thing with NPCs. Um, our, 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 one of the first things that kids did in the context of our lab was engage in some walking diaries. And they, you know, they were like surprised by what the NPCs were saying to them. And they were like, it sounds like godly goop, but sometimes it's just like triggering because it sounds misogynist and racist. What would happen if my if I could just walk down the street and it sounded like my community in Aurora, where I heard my auntie telling a story on the corner, or I heard my mother um, recounting a story that that mattered to her. Um, and this is get we've started to code in some of those narratives into into the in the non playable characters that exist in the city. Furthermore, um, we have uh, really started to think about everyday technologies that our characters might leverage in the city. 
Now, as you know, that the you, you actually you may not know, but uh, GTA Five takes place within the context of Los Santos, which is modeled off of Los Angeles. Um, furthermore, the uh, city kind of has a a a, a, a low rider narrative th d d throughout the game, um, such that you can actually purchase cars, you can put car wraps on cars. Um, and this inspired us uh, last year to go to a car show um, to learn more about what lowriders actually do in the creation of cars. And we learned about the the narratives that they that that they uh, uh, create um, in uh, on their on their lowriders. Um, in fact, the the kids when they showed up, they were you know they they saw cars and they were like, oh my god, that's my character's car right there. I might tweak this, but that is exactly it. Um, but what's important here is that lowriders in particular create cars that are imb embedded in them are narratives of resistance. Um, and so this gave us an idea. Do we stick with the base mechanics that the game has given us? Or is it possible for us to actually recode the game and share the narratives that matter to us? And we started to do that, actually. So this is these are some of the first initial prototypes. Um, we actually put the Virgencita, the 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 Virgin Mary, on our car. Um, we created a, a car club in our in our city, um, in our partnership with the Spec Lab through Dr. Jose Luis Sarraga. We actually uh, started to code in um, some some new things that we were engaged in with digital fabrication. We were inspired to create some new jewelry that we have subsequently coded into the city, like rings and earrings and necklaces, so our characters can actually wear these things. Um, this placa that you see right here, this is typically what goes on the back of a lowrider car. You saw it in the previous slide. Um, this is what we coded into the city right here. We actually created it first. We digitally fabricated it, and then we coded it into the city. Okay. We have created murals in the city. Um, in Colorado, uh, late last year, um, there was a tragedy um, at Club Q um, where several queer people were murdered. Um, and as I said before, a lot of our um, uh, the young folks that we work with are black and brown queer people. And they wanted to memorialize this event in the city. And what you see in the, in the background here is actually this mural that we created and were able to code into the city. We've coded in other murals like the George Floyd mural. We have uh, pride monuments. And of course, these are all related to storylines that our characters have developed. Um, in addition, we've repurposed growing opportunities. As I said, GTA is really about um, drugs and violence. Um, so we've repurposed seeding pathways and created sustainable agriculture, um, making sure that our, 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 our characters, you know, are able to thrive and live in these spaces. We've also uh, developed storylines about the supernatural, repurposing crystal meth in, in the city to uh, become healing crystals that heal us in the process of our storylines as we play. Um, in fact, we got this idea when, um, pardon me, um, one of our undergraduates was a chemistry major um, and was really perplexed about how pervasive crystal meth was in the city and started, he actually went and talked to his professor and said, is it possible to like add something new to crystal meth to make it into something that actually is beneficial and uh, helpful for us? And his professor said, no, <laughs> but in, in his collaboration with uh, some some uh, the high school students, they came up with this really cool supernatural nar uh, narrative and storyline that allowed them to really think about how crystal meth could be repurposed. So what's powerful here is that we're getting a chance to see how disciplinary domain knowledge, along with the imagination, are creating new opportunities for repurposing tools. Um, we're learning how to use motion capture, to capture some of the ways that we uh, want to see our characters move in the city. Um, some of our characters feel like the, 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 the base mechanics of the game don't capture the swag and the fabulousness of their queerness. Um, and so we're working uh, to capture some of those gates in order to code them into the city. Now, one of the key questions that we typically get asked about our work is, you know, kids don't this the folks actually say, you know, kids don't play games to critically analyze them. 
And we say, sure, probably you might be right. But in the context of our lab, we really scaffold um, opportunities for kids to, to critically examine gameplay. And we do that by by um, getting our by reading with our kids some social theory. So we read Dr. Ruha Benjamin's work with them. We read Edward Said. Um, we read other critical scholars to help them reimagine what could possibly exist in the city. Now we're we're caught in this really interesting space because you're not supposed to engage in fail RP. Uh, which means fail role play, right? So like you, anything that you do in the city can't have any connection to your IRL persona. Um, so one way that we've gotten around that is that um, our kids, their characters have started to spray paint um, quotes and images from uh, the social theory uh, that we've been reading in the city such that, their, such that their characters can leverage these ideas as they battle um, and, and create new storylines in the city. So let me get a little bit more con concrete about some of the narratives and storylines that have existed and then I'm about to wrap up really quickly. So we've had elections in the city. Um, we, we have a fully functioning radio station. Um, we have reporters in the city. So here's an example of a report on the elections. And you can all hear that or no? Were you able to hear that perfectly? Okay, great. Let me go back. Elections, often stressful times for citizens. We are faced with the questions, who should we vote for and who will advocate for our needs best? Well, I interviewed citizens like you and I, as well as the candidates themselves. I'm gonna stop there. This is Bella Lona. One of our high school students, um, uh, well, her, their character's name is Bella Lona. Um, our high school student is a reporter, interviewed various uh, uh, characters in the city to create this, this uh, podcast that was aired on our radio station that you can actually hear in city. Um, and you can also uh, uh, listen to it IRL. Um, and I'll put that link into the chat in case you ever want to listen in. We've got some really cool music that's that's playing right now as well. But what Bella Lona was was uh, 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 you know talking about was the 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 elections that took place right at the beginning of the inception of our city. We've got Shandy Green. This candidate says the future is mine, crossing it out. Ours. We can get a sense of who this character is. We've got Obi Dahomey, who's a middle of the road candidate, um, and then we have another ca a, a character who is um, running on an anarchist uh, a ticket. Um, they didn't have uh, a poster because they said if you vote for them, um, there will never be elections again. We're destroying the government. Um, so the kids get a chance to kind of play with new types of governmental systems uh, that 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 we we've, we've held pride in the city, which was a lot of fun. Um, so really quickly, um, how we've uh, you know developed over the course of a few years is that um, we started to understand Los Santos. We recognized that it's steeped in all of these oppressive systems, um, that th this was a, a time of violent turmoil. And then our crew actually showed up in the city and we started to take over the media. We, we um, had elections in the city. We, there was this really interesting uh, storyline that emerged where we try, were trying to make sense of why the radio stations that were given in the base uh, uh, structure of the game, why they were so misogynist um, and why there were billboards that, that showcased transphobia and homophobia. And uh, the kids, along with the educators, developed this storyline that there was this misogynist man named Ernesto de la Cruz who was responsible for this. And uh, what happened was that the kids, along with the educators, were able to uh, overthrow that, that media conglomerate and created a new one in its wake called Lit City News. Um, and that's what we saw earlier. During the next semester, um, we fast forwarded a hundred years and our city became a post-apocalyptic uh, post wasteland um, where many people were gone. So the NPCs, we coded out the NPCs, me and the educators, we, we kind of prepared this situation. 
um, such that there were, there was like, um, you know, decrepit buses in the city, buildings had fallen down. Um, and this was a hundred years into the future. And this crew of, of new students who showed up into our space had to figure out what happened. Um, and we, you know, they, they created flyers. They, we, we, they, they found, you know, newspaper clippings such as uh, this artificial intelligence, facial recognition software. Um, it says forensic sketch artist program launches nationally and internationally. Suspects in the thousands have already been apprehended across the globe. The world is rooting out the criminals. So kids, when they would move around the city, would find these newspaper clippings from 100 years ago and would consider, is this why our city fell 100 years ago? Is it this facial recognition software? Is it about cheap alternatives to 23andMe, an AI tool that can detect ethnicity immediately? So we were inspiring new storylines through the context of these uh, newspaper clippings that really helped them think about the role of AI in the downfall of society. We also started to see opportunities where kids were role-playing by becoming AI. Um, so we had digidogs in the city and kids would become digidogs. Um, they would develop characters around these. Some of them, some of the digidogs were mean, some of them were nice. Um, they also developed uh, really, you know, interesting characters that were emblematic in our view of strong AI. Echo is an example. Echo, darling, are you off playing with the humans again? Hmm. I do believe playing and learning can be the same thing. So you can say that I am off learning with the humans. I. I'm gonna stop there. So we we get a sense of a. Uh, of a, a young person really developing out this new character called Echo. Um, and anytime a new character get, gets introduced to a city, a podcast would be created and it would be aired on the radio station so you can get a sense of their lore. Um, and Echo was, you know, a, a, an AI that could be molded. Um, and so um, Echo was people, the, the characters in our city were initially very wary of Echo, um, but later came around to liking her because they recognized that she was actually, um, they developed the storyline, co-constructed it with Echo, that she was actually responsible for saving the city and saving the remaining 10% that survived. So I, I'm going to end here and say, you know, this is how we're learning about AI in the context of our space. Um, we're learning to play with it. We're learning to code it. We're learning how it works, the weak forms of how they work and how they're coded into gaming spaces. But we're also learning how to hack them. And I know that Jose in particular, I've, I was inspired by his work here uh, with respect to strong AI, is that we're really trying to think about um, how we can prepare for a potential future where um, harms might be present. Of course, harms exist in the here and now, but what might future harms look like and how, how can we prevent them from happening? Um, lastly, we're really interested in how um, we can you know, re challenge uh, and, and prevent a future on the horizon, uh, given what we know about what's happening in the present. And we do not try to limit um, our possibilities for social dreaming. We encourage young folks to be as fantastical and as imaginative as possible, in part because it gives us a sense of like, what are young people's hopes? What are their fears? What are their, their desires as it relates to AI? And I just really want to end by saying, this is all done through the context of an everyday technology like a video gaming platform. This is a space where young people are already learning in, you know, either implicitly or explicitly about their relationships with AI. And our goal in the Lit Lab is to support them in developing opportunities to critique, to hack, and to reimagine um, this particular technology. And so I'm going to end there. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, take it away, <laughs> Dr. Lucaraga.
My apologies. I am working on multiple screens, so I couldn't tell <laughs> where, where, no people, problem. where people were, <laughs> what, what you were looking at. So I was mortified that you might have been seeing the 12,000 emails um on my email I account. I did not see any emails. Um, <laughs> we see your screen. Your including emails I haven't responded uh, from Dr. Smith that I haven't responded to. Um <laughs> uh that is um you, uh, what a what a hard act to follow. Uh, but I, I feel like it's uh you'll you'll notice that we there will be some intersecting uh themes that you see cut across both me and um Arturo's uh work. And also some slight departures that are informed by um, a lot of my attention to uh, being story driven in my work, but also um, how uh, I am unapologetically informed by my own histories and my own desire to center uh, Chicanx and Latinx praxis to the way that we tell stories and how those stories animate our engagement with technology and um uh, and technologies writ large and so i am really driven by this notion of futurity and 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 the speculative and how um um often even our imaginings of the of the speculative and futurity uh, without intention are informed by colonial logics or the hopes, dreams, and desires of communities that are not our own communities. Um, what Dr. B uh, Joy Bolamwini calls uh, as animated by those who are um, male and pale. And we, a lot of my work, uh, including the work that I do um, beyond the academy, is about those types of, of disruptions. And so I'm going to spend some time ruminating with collectively with you all about um, what it means to think about this, this futurity uh, and engage with that question of futuro de quien, whose future are we thinking about as we are uh, imagining and designing for new social futures, specifically through um, um, my this, this term that I've been working on called fabulation. Oh, there it is. And so I, I want to begin by saying that um, my notion of the cyborg, which is something that emerges in a lot of my writing, um, in a sense, these centers um, um, this idea that that the cyborg is uh, a person who is uh, augmented uh, by certain kinds of digital technologies or or specific um, or specific kinds of technologies. Um, my idea of the cyborg actually emerges, as you can see in in, in a recent piece that I uh, wrote for the Journal of Learning Sciences, actually emerges from what I, I observed um, my parents do uh, as they tried to, uh, in a sense, carve their own narratives of who they wanted to be and the agency they wanted to carve in spaces that were not designed for them or for us, in spaces that often relegated them to the margins or saw them as less than human. My mother, for example, she was a lettuce cutter in the in the fields, in the in the fertile fields of Salinas Valley, and she had this knife, um, this specific lettuce cut, cutting knife that I was always fascinated uh, by because in a sense, it was an extension of her corporeality that allowed her to do her job well. She was really good at her job of, of cutting lettuce, but I was always fascinated by this very specialized knife that allowed her to do to do that work. And similarly, in my dad's uh, line of work, he was both a lettuce, uh, I'm sorry, both a butcher, a meat cutter at a local carniceria, but also ran a landscaping business that I helped him with. And what I was really attuned to were the kinds of tools that extended his corporeality and in, sense, in a sense, my corporeality when I helped him as well um, to create something beautiful, albeit in the space that didn't belong to us. But in a sense, I was making a mark uh, in a space that wasn't designed for me. I created a beautiful landscape lawn by using these very specific tools that allowed me to do so. So in a sense, I was always exploring how tools, any types of tools that extend our, our humanity, allow us to have agency 
in the ways that we um, decide to tell the stories or mark uh, uh, mark up a space that is not designed um, for us. Um, but I need to also underscore that I've been a technologist since I can remember. Um, this is kind of a simulation of uh, an instant message, an AOL <laughs> instant, instant message um, interaction that I might have had as a as a youth, specifically as a young queer youth in the remote areas of Salinas, where I didn't know, or I probably didn't meet a, a, my first queer person until I was probably in, in high school. But I did use technology to try to connect to um to to see myself out there beyond the 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 world that was visible to me and that 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 I interacted with on, on a daily basis. I connected to with with other queer people on um topics around Sailor Moon, which was <laughs> another another uh media artifact that helped facilitate some of this some of this engagement. And so but for me Technology has been that part uh, or has been part of that um, continued endeavor to tell my story and to connect to others, to collectively tell stories and to connect uh, um, uh, my humanity to others. And so similarly to what Dr. Cortez, my, my partner, mentioned earlier in this talk, the pandemic actually reminded me a lot of the isolation that I experienced as a young person. And it reminded me of how to use these technologies to engage in that type of connectivity that I remember doing as a, as a young person. And that actually served as an impetus for the types of uh, work that we decided to do during the pandemic and, and, and now in the later stages of, of, of an enduring uh, pandemic. So in a, in a way, the cyborg for me, and as it's connected to um, this uh, idea of speculative fa uh, fabulation uh, is about world uh, um, or about worlding rather building worlds in the natural technical in natural technical worlds that need care and response worlds that are that are broken and that are harmed. Um, this is an opportunity to engage in that type of of healing. For me, in, in the ways that I've written about the cyborg, and this is there's a typo here because this is Lisa Ragan in review, but it's obviously already been published. For me, the cyborg is about enhancing our humanity and relationships with other humans and more than human companions. So in a way, it's about moving beyond the Anthropocene and also decentering um our need to center humanity as being the 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 kind of the superior species on on our planet and um and so it is a, a, about engaging with 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 that with the with those more than human um ideas and what i explore in my work in particular is this um these practices that i call the, cy the cyborg social political technical reconfiguration where learners are assembled ideational and material tools to craft objects of learning activity that went beyond, beyond those established by teachers in schooling and that in a sense have some consequence to our everyday uh, lives. And you'll notice that this little illustration actually has a Nintendo Switch and it has other types of digital technologies as well. But for me, the Nintendo Switch was actually one of those instrumental technologies during the pandemic that helped me do some of this um, sociopolitical reconfiguration that I'm talking about. And so I want to highlight some some things that have emerged across, you know, now that I've established where this this kind of notion of the cyborg comes uh, from me, um, and how and the approach that I have to digital technologies and other technologies writ large. Um, this is a, actually from my dissertation study, and it actually and, and you'll see it reflected in the article um, that uh, uh, Professor Smith just put in the in the chat. And it revolves around this um, um, after-school program, a social design-based uh, um, space in an after-school program in Oakland, uh, California, actually it was in Richmond, California, where undergraduate students um, served as mentors to uh, predominantly Latinx and uh, or Latina and uh, Black youth. It was an after-school movie-making um, space where 
uh, our undergraduates guided the young people in developing sci-fi movies in particular. They were guided, um, and this was something that was informed by, by the desires of, of the kids. They wanted to uh, create fantastical uh, movies, but the, the, the subtext there too is that they wanted to learn how to do editing and they wanted to learn how to do uh, use all of the the fancy technology uh that they saw kind of like reflected in their in their in, in the favorite movies that they had uh, in, during that time now an important thing to note here is that an after school space be within the context of of the physical space of of, of schooling um you know often there's some defaulted um um, ideas in terms of what is possible and what what one what one can engage with in in a school space like that. And so for a while, actually, there was a a um, tentativeness of our youth to actually talk about their everyday experiences with harms or or any type of um, real socio political stuff that was happening in their lives. We kept reminding them that that was okay and that. No, that the teachers were not involved in this space, that they were the ones who were driving the space. And that's when the kids uh, asked me, and I was doing supply runs, they asked me to get them a Trump um, uh, mask for their for their, uh, for their their filmmaking. So you see here, this little gif, uh, this gif of a Trump mask <laughs> that was used for a sci-fi movie that they, um, that a group of young Latina, um, uh, Latina girls uh, created. Of a of note here, because of the type of of design space that we create created in this in in my after school program, they roped in the instructor to be part of the ma movie making. So this is actually an undergraduate uh, pre service teacher who they roped in to play uh, Trump in their movie. Um. Now, of note here is that this was a sci-fi movie, so they wanted to engage with what they felt was a everyday, very real harms that uh, the then um, President Trump was kind of spewing out all these um, vitriolic narratives about um, uh, immigrants uh, and the Latinx uh, community. They wanted to create something that was fantastical to kind of like help them imagine what it would feel like and look like to um, free themselves of uh, of this type of tyranny. They developed a film where Trump um, colluded with an invading um, uh, alien army um, to subdue and subvert, oh, not subvert, to subdue and to control the, the populace. And so they imagined him as a futuristic looking, um, um uh tyrant um again they learned how to do all the editing they 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 engage in some of that disciplinary type of um and literacy type of work when uh, but always driven with this by this idea that they wanted to create this fantastical film um where eventually um first they evaded the evaded Trump and his army and then imagined that, they would somehow generate a black hole that would suck the army away along with the with the with the, um the then president trump um they did research on black holes and singularities to figure out how what that would look like uh so they were doing all of this this uh deep disciplinary research to figure out how plausible and feasible it would be to for for this um to to happen, but again, to underscore that there is a a version of fantastical futurity that is uh, possible when we design environments um, where we remind uh, young people that they are they are they have full permission to engage with the social political, and also where they are reminded that there is a flattening of hierarchies where the adults in the space can actually. Um, be involved in the playful imagination and, and creation of, of the space. Something that, of course, we just saw in Dr. Cortez's um, presentation, that, that is something that him and I and, and many of our colleagues are adamant about when we when we design these, these spaces. 
Um, another thing I want to show here is um, from the same article that that um, that was just highlighted earlier. Um, is this actually happened during the pandemic? We had to move our making and tinkering lab and digital fabrication lab completely uh, online, uh, which meant that um, we had to do most of our sessions one on one uh, via Zoom. And we sent kits out to young people, uh, making and tinkering uh, kits and robotics um, kits to, to, to young people. Um, what I want to showcase here is this another articulation of this futurity that that um that I that I was just talking about, and how it's you know futurity is based in like this broader kind of narrative that we start building about who we want to be and who we desire to be, and even a young person can start projecting into that future in in a small interaction uh, about talking about their. A, a, an accomplishment. So I'm going to show a very short clip here of, uh, and I'm realizing right now that I don't know if I'm sharing my audio, so I might have to stop share really quick because I don't think I'm sharing my audio. Give me a second. Okay, optimize and share. Okay. Uh, so this is at the end of a cycle of them building uh, robots, uh, a robot arm. Um, so I, I'll, I'll let the clip uh, speak for itself a little bit, and then I'll, I'll contextualize it a little bit more. Yeah. Did that work at all? It's getting bigger. Whoa. Yeah, I think you got it. I think maybe um, the slider you can move away. Sorry, I'm going to fast forward it a little bit. I realized that it didn't automatically. Oh, you want to see what I do? I'm a genius. Oh, is that your homework? Yes. Is that math? Yes. Whoa. I'm going in fifth grade. So um, you might have missed it because I fast forwarded a little a little too much. But at the end of completing the robotic arm, they were trying to troubleshoot it because it wasn't properly working. At the end, she says about herself, I'm a genius. And she says it actually a couple of times. And then you cut the tail end where she said, I'm a genius again, and then showed off her 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 her, her math homework. And so I, one of the things that, that um, I'm going to skip through a little bit here is that um, uh, the teacher or, or the undergraduate um, uh, pre-service teacher um, used this example of her um, of co-learning how to do this with and build this robot with this uh, young person to understand and highlight the types of narratives and stories that kids are t often probably tell about themselves quite regularly, but we are not, we don't have the, the um, what's called, our lenses are not sophisticated enough often to see those fleeting moments of young people telling us who they want to be who they are now and who they want to be. And so uh, I know I'm running a little bit over time, but I wanted to highlight um, that aspect of, of, of the work. And I'm going to skip that again. Part of the continued work is that we're I'm trying to find ways where digital fabrication uh, can, can coalesce with other types of storytelling, specifically around gaming. Arturo already talked about this, so I'm not going to spend uh, time talking about this, but we have been having a lot of fun collaborating together and because Boulder did it, we don't have a lab at Boulder proper, the kids come to our garage and they do <laughs> digital fabrication uh, occasionally in our garage. Uh, finally, one of the, I want to uh, just hat tip to the work that I'm doing beyond the academy around um, um, 
uh, uh, AI and facial recognition technology and, and the carceral pedagogies and, and frameworks and logics that inform um, the development of AI. Arturo already talked a little bit about that, but I wanted to highlight some of the other creative ways that we see uh, communities of artists resist um, the the surveillance of, digi of, of um, facial recognition technologies and other AI. I, I'm leaning heavily on these examples in my continued work. Um, Again, not only within um, my work, scholarly work at the university, but also beyond in more public spaces. And finally, I want to highlight um, some, and this is, comes from a talk that I gave recently uh, for UNESCO uh, around how uh, we need to continue our, our critical examinations and understandings of AI, speci specifically generative AI, uh, but also the possibilities of using uh, generative AI and hacking or tweaking generative AIs, the AI to tell the types of stories that we want to tell about ourselves. As a brief example here, this is when the, when the the Wakanda Forever movie first came out. I wanted to um, uh, generate an image that connected me to to uh, the movie uh, because it was the first time that we saw a Mexican. Uh, origin person, someone who looked like me, I felt in a blockbuster movie. And when I first entered in Mid Journey, the prompt uh, Namur Wakanda Forever, it generated um, an image of, that was highly uh, westernized and <laughs> didn't look like the actual character that we saw in, in the movie. Uh, but after some tweaking and uploading my own images, I was able to create um, from the generative AI something a narrative, a, a, a semblance of of and connection to this media artifact that felt more representative of who uh, I wanted it to be. Uh, and that's it. Sorry. <laughs> no apologies needed. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna go ahead and can also. Uh, we just have a few minutes um, left for for questions, um, conversation, things that came up for you. You can use the Q and A or the chat, um, and uh, yeah, let's just open it up to. There's a lot of been going on in the chat. Some of the chat <laughs> we noticed. Some people only have capacity to to chat with hosts and panelists. So go ahead and and bring up anything um, again that we need to for everyone. So so if there's any questions, go ahead and put those in the Q and A for the um, webinar chat, that'd be great. There was a, a maybe to kick off, um, there was a question about, um, uh, from Josh Piper, who was saying, uh, what you explained was learning at its finest, messy, dirty, exhilarating, beautiful, and hard. How have you helped move others past a notion of learning as prepared and guided? And we've been thinking about how much more scriptedness there has been, these pushes to dehumanize classrooms even more um, in that sense. Uh, so, uh, and I know that Dr. Cortez has was able to do a response in the chat, but maybe let, let maybe that's a place to start. Is how in your through your work are you seeing ways to help people push past that that traditional notion of learning? I really love Thomas Phillips' notion of improvisation um, because I think it gives us some freedom uh, to. I'm a former teacher. Um, I, I taught in classrooms for several years where we were expected. Uh, my principal said that when she walked by my door, she could hear me start a sentence. And that when she walked by my partner teacher's classroom door, she could hear my partner teacher finish that sentence. That's how much she wanted us to be on a script. Um, and we resist that. I res I've, I've learned to resist that notion. And I, I love the, the Thomas Phillips notion of improvisation because it gives us the freedom to resist those types of scripts. But furthermore, when we lean into the everyday, 
when we lean into to spaces where we are building and playing together, like for example, as adults, one of those spaces might be like hanging out on a Saturday night with our friends after we've watched a movie. Maybe perhaps we've had a glass of wine or something. Those are spaces of everydayness. Like they're spaces of discovery, spaces of play, spaces where we're searching for some meaning. And they're not straightforward. You know, we don't input, we don't have an input of X and expect an outcome of Y. Um, it's a dance. It's an improvisational uh, moment. And that's what humans do best, in my view. It's an opportunity for transformation. And I, we try to replicate those types of moments in informal learning environments, because we're given that freedom to do that in informal learning environments. And in, in, and with informal K-12 classrooms, we don't have that much freedom. But I, I found that as a teacher, I, I could find those moments when I Yeah, I, I echo that completely. And I think for me and Arturo, I think it's because because of who we are. We tend to model that as well, right? So our even our in, in our our in our graduate and undergraduate courses, rather than just um abstractly and and conceptually uh explaining that this is important. We actually do it in in the in our in our classrooms, and I think one of the most essential things about the types of uh, um, uh, higher ed spaces that Arturo and I design is that we really push for opportunities to actually create uh, um, intergenerational and, tr and and transdisciplinary spaces that rupture the 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 walls of, of the university classroom we try to find funding to make sure that high schoolers are taking our classes with their undergrads and that are and that our uh, graduate students uh, are able to do a gra to be, make sure that we're all collectively in 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 that space playing with the same tools including the the readings we have high schoolers reading college college um um uh, le college level uh reading you know it, there there's some important ways to to rupture it but i i think i mean it, it's important to underscore that it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of, of of resources and hopefully we are trying to find ways to to make sure that 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 um that is seen as something valuable that that uh administrators and universities um recognize as something that we we need to continue to support There's a question that came in from Santiago. Thank you for sending that question in. Um, they say, thank you um, too for all of this. Jose, do you see any special implications for fabulation that might appear in human AI cyborgs? I feel that we're all becoming kind of human AI cyborgs with chat GPT and other AI. Yeah, yeah so you, you know, I, 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 I love that question. And thank you, Arturo, for putting me back in there. You know, one of the things that... Um, we uh, in this. I love that you asked that question because I actually I had a similar question in the in the tech uh, AI uh, summit that I just spoke at. And one of the I, I think that last um, slide that I that I posted that I showed you around creating using generative AI to create an image of of Namor is an example of what I hope we can push towards, which is a continued um, examination and challenging of the colonial logics that inform our, the automated um, um, systems that we use, including generative AI. And so I was talking to a set of tech people, right? And so I was telling them like, you need to be transparent about your models. You need to be transparent about the data that's uh, the, the training data that is informing your models, because obviously even when you type in the more and Wakanda forever, you have data that's informing it, that telling it, telling it that the 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 default the more should look like a, a European man with huge muscles, even though we have a main, a primary source data set that can tell you that that's not that's not what the more looks like. And so uh, I think there's there's in terms of fabulation, in terms of centering story, because I think that's 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 the fabu fabulation is about centering story. I think um, that is the primary implication in terms of if if 
when we're using these types of, of AI and and generative AI as a part of telling a story that feels like it's authentic to us, then we start seeing kind of the cracks, the cracks in the code, right? Because we see that the the that the output is not a reflection of us. It's not, it doesn't look um look like us. Um there's a lot of work that I think still needs to be happen to happen in, in that in that regard. But I think theoretically and conceptually that's where that's where some some of the implications can come from. I hope that answers your question. I hope it wasn't too. I love that question so much. <laughs> and I'd love to just say, like, I think what I'm I'm hearing from that question is that it's an opportunity to really trouble the boundaries between the virtual and analog spaces. Um, you know, what 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 helps us in maintaining that boundary? And what opens up when we trouble the boundary between virtual and IRL? So one example that I can think about is like, what would happen if we as educators started to lean into chat GPT? What if we actually expected our students to send in chat GPT created writing? Um, what kinds of new assignments might emerge as a result? What new fabulations might we create and with what kinds of media? Um, I'm really excited about chat GPT uh, for that reason, I also recognize that there's some constraints. We should be weary of it. Um, we should also make sure that we read the proviso that says that if you're under 18, you should not be operating ChatGPT because you're providing it with data. So keep that in mind. So I say this with some caution. Um, I'm not asking you all to go and start working with, with ChatGPT with young folks, but I'm asking us to think, how can we examine it creatively in order to learn how to decode it and to recode it, perhaps? Thank you so much. I don't want to to hold off, hold over people too long. There was a, another great question, speak, going back to stories too, about which stories and how. Do, what do we do with the stories that that perpetuate the status quo, um, and and for whom that's their a student's authentic story. Um, how do we how do we share stories that coexist and can be woven together? What do we do with that? I don't know if that's something we can grapple <laughs> with in just a few minutes. But is there any um, any thoughts on that as we, we head out? Go forth and dream. Don't limit opportunities to tell stories mm -hmm. with others. Don't tell individual stories, tell collective stories, mm -hmm. collective stories of resistance. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, the, the collective and cooperative aspect of storytelling is is what's what allows us again to see any of of the cracks <laughs> um but also storytelling is not about just like like verbatim throwing everything out there storytelling is about editing storytelling is about mm -hmm. knowing audience trust that process we 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 are storytellers and i think there are ways that we can we can um trust that process of of dreaming together and 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 so on. Uh, I can't think of, of a better way to, to leave on that idea of dream together, go forward with those, the collaborative stories, the, the stories that we edit, revise, revisit, um, and retell. It's beautiful. Thank you so much for your time um, and expertise that you've shared with us. Uh, and um, we, uh, I can't wait for our futures. I'm gonna. <laughs> we may be sending you questions <laughs> after this. Um, we would love to continue the conversations across spaces too. So hopefully, we can get the podcast link and um, to Lit City, and so we can hear that. That'd be awesome. Too. All right. Thank you so much to everyone, and um, we will see you online. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs>